with the ship of your life is tossing on that sea of strife and if you can be
about the coming Messiah. We're going to just read one verse. And uh, it really focuses on one word. And that word is eternity. Uh, we do our church focuses, and one of our first focuses was a one word focus. I mean, remember uh, our focus, Brother Arnold Alanese had his service here, and uh, Christina here and Colleen and stuff, and, and he had this eternity lapel pin yeah. on, on his jacket. And I thought, uh, that's a great word to have on your jacket. Mm -hmm. and he's ready, amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's read this verse. Isaiah 57, 15. But for thus said the high and lofty Lord, notice that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I live, I dwell in the high and holy place. With him also, in other words, there's other people welcome to be with me, live there, that is of a contrite, a repentant and humble or broken spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the spirit of the repentant ones. So our focus as a church is the power of one Lord and one surrendered life. Our focus verse is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. We say it together. Now unto him that is able to do Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask, ask or think, according to the power that worketh in, in us. And so how amazing it is to realize that the Lord, and this, when I say the Lord, we're talking the creator of the heaven and the earth, the creator of the universe, can use us to impact the world, or our world even, for him. And so the secret doesn't lie in our strength. It doesn't lie in our personality. But really a life yielded to Him. There's where the power connection is. A surrendered life. And so this message this morning is about just that. It's about one man. And really, not just one man, but one word that who has challenged His word by the reality of an eternity spent with or without the Lord. Now, if you had a time machine, you could be transported back to Sydney, Australia, and it would be the, the, the new millennium, the 2,000 year celebration uh, of, of uh, the new millennium where you could. Uh, visit Sydney Harbor and all the goings on there. And then if you go to Sydney Harbor, you see the bridge, the Sydney Harbor Bridge. And there it was. i never forget it. It seems rather unusual as we look at that bridge to see one word stretched across the bridge. Keep in mind, this is just, this is a quote-unquote secular celebration of the new millennium. And of course, there's a story behind that word. The story entered my life in the form of a gospel track when I was on a mission trip to Melbourne, Australia. And the story impressed me so much that I came back and shared it with this church. And that's been a while ago. But I'd like to share it again because it is the story of just one person. One surrendered, yielded life. And so in 1984, Arthur Malcolm Stace was born in Sydney's Balmain slums. His parents were addicted to alcohol, and consequently, young Arthur was raised in poverty. He was raised uh, neglected and needy. And there's this world and this city is full of kids like that. Domestic violence in this home was the norm. It was said that it was so bad that the children would frequently, the children would frequently sleep in uh, uh, burlap bags, toe sacks we used to call them, under the house. Well, why would they sleep under the house? Well, to escape the, the wrath of a drunken, violent father. And as a result, 
Much, as, much of his childhood was spent stealing bread, stealing milk, as well as searching for food in the garbage bins. His schooling was almost non-existent. And at the age 12, Arthur found himself as a ward of the state. You might say the child protection services get them. As he entered his teenage years, he turned worse. He became a very heavy drinker at the age of 15 and was thrown into jail. In and out of jail, Arthur helped those who, uh, who ran the illegal gambling bins and brothels in Sydney. He served as their uh, lookout. Uh -huh. The police are coming. 15-year-old boy, it's good to do that, you know. And in his 20s, he became a recruiter for his sister's brothels in a city district of Sydney known as Surrey Hills. On the outbreak of World War I, Arthur Stay served his country in France. He was sent to the battlefields as a stretcher bearer and a drummer. And there on the battlefields in France, he witnessed the horrors of trench warfare under heavy, heavy artillery bombardment, freezing conditions, and he received several, several injuries, uh, one of which uh, impacted his sight. He lost sight in one of his eyes. 1919, Arthur was discharged. And he came home suffering from shell shock, as well as the effects of a poisonous mustard gas. And from then, until his mid-40s, through the Great Depression, Arthur kept sliding down, 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 into a miserable life, until he was found drinking the thylated spirits anything that had any alcohol in it. He would get it for pennies, a body. And he lived on what he could find in the trash cans and handouts. And that was his life. But things began to change. When Arthur came under the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, there were people in Sydney that cared. And he found himself attending meetings at St. Barnabas Church. It was pastored by Reverend R.D.S. Hammond. Many came there for food, and as it is today, we'll feed you, but you got to listen to the message first. Yeah. <laughs> and so he did. The ministry was called Meetings for Needy Men. And at the end of one particular service, on August the 6th, 1930, Arthur left the church, <coughs> walked across the street to what's called Victoria Park, and under an old fig tree, surrendered his heart Amen. to Jesus Christ. He believed the gospel the good news that God loved him so much that he sent his son. Amen. And from that moment on, Arthur was a changed man. He immediately turned from an old life of crime and corruption to a new life in Jesus Christ. Yes. You know, it begins on the inside out, not the outside in. And he became a teachable, faithful, obedient servant of Jesus Christ. <coughs> he gave up drinking altogether. He found a steady job. Later, Arthur said at this time, I went to get a cup of tea and a rock cake, but I met the rock of ages. Amen. 
His life changed. Sometime later, the Bruton Street Baptist Tabernacle of Dalhurst, uh, Australia, uh, he became a member. He was baptized, became a member. And that church had a revival. I remember, remember revival meetings. You know? They were you know, a couple of times a year. And the Dalhurst Church invited a, an evangelist named John G. Ridley to preach the meeting. The gospel was preached. And Ridley has uh, had a common, has something in common with Arthur Stace. He had served in World War I. He had been in the fields of France. He had won medals for bravery in battle. As a matter of fact, while the evangelist uh, was in the war, a German bullet passed through his face and impaired his speech. But God healed him and restored him and actually transformed him into a quite eloquent and powerful, powerful preacher. And on a Sunday night, November the 14th, he preached a message from Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. And he entitled the message, Echoes of Eternity. And over and over, the evangelist stressed that word, eternity, eternity. Preacher Ridley pointed out in his message what he called the echoes of eternity that were present everywhere. He said the echoes of eternity are present in creation. Oh, we know that today more than ever, don't we? The echoes of eternity are in the Christian's life and, and especially at the cross. And then suddenly the evangelist laid aside his nose. And he raised his voice and he said this, eternity, eternity. I wish I could sound or shout that word to everyone in the streets of Sydney. You've got to meet it. Where will you spend eternity? Amen. Well, God was in that connection. And Arthur Stace was one of many to hear that message that evening. But Arthur says, it's like the Lord spoke to me. I could hear his voice. And he said this, that word, the word eternity, went ringing in my mind. Eternity, eternity. And suddenly I began to cry. I felt a powerful call from the Lord to write that one word, eternity. He goes on, I had a piece of chalk in my pocket. <laughs> and once outside the church, I bent down right there. And I wrote it. I could hardly write my own name. I had no schooling. And I couldn't have spelled eternity for a hundred quid. <laughs> but it came out smoothly in a beautiful copper plate script. couldn't understand it. And I still can't. When the God of eternity revived the heart of his servant Arthur that night. Think about this man. Where he came from. One message changed him. He trusted Christ, changed his life. And then another message revived him. And really Gave him a one man, one word ministry. This was the beginning of a one word <coughs> ministry. Just one person can make a difference Amen. when they surrender themselves to the Lord. Think about that word. Eternity. What a powerful, powerful word. It's a wonderful word. It's full of meaning. Really? It's full of mystery. Arthur Stace wrote that word in chalk. 
and crayon for 37 years, over 500,000 times on footpaths, sidewalks, anywhere in Sydney. He would get up in the early hours of the morning and he would leave his home on Primark about 5 o'clock or 5.30 after praying for an hour or so. And then he would go where he really believed in his heart that God directed him for that day and he would write every 100 meters or so on the pavement wherever that one word, eternity, and he'd always put it where people couldn't miss it. You know? No one knew who he was. And that's just the way he liked it. He went everywhere. Everywhere in Sydney. Writing that one large word. That little gray-haired man who stood only five foot five to three inches. And he came to be known as Mr. Columnists, journalists, wrote, speculated as to the identity of this mystery messenger. There were others that even took credit. But no one really knew who he was. Each day the, the people would, would report that Mr. Eternity strikes again. <laughs> it was evangelism by intrigue. And so what was it like, I wonder, to uh, be a resident of Sydney and walk across that mysterious word written by that mysterious little man? Someone said this. It was an unforgettable moment of my childhood. I went to fetch the milk at our front gate one morning, and in the footpath was the chalk word, Eternity. And it wasn't until 1956 that the riddle was solved. Arthur was now a janitor. And he was a prayer warrior at the Burton Street Baptist Church. And one day the pastor of that church, of Reverend Lyle M. Thompson, happened to come upon him as he was writing the word Eternity in the pavement, not knowing he was being watched. Pastor Thompson said, Are you Mr. Eternity? And Arthur replied, Guilty. And on June the 21st, 1956, the Sydney Telegraph published an interview with Arthur Stace, and everyone finally knew his identity. The 24-year-old ministry was now solved. Arthur Stace continued his one word ministry. For many years he kept it up. He also had a preaching ministry on the street corner of George and Bathurst in the city of Sydney. And he would place his Bible on the ground and he would cover his Bible with his hat. And then he would start walking around out on the street pointing to the hat and he would say, It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> and people would, you know, what in the world? Gather around. And he would pick up the hat and there was his Bible. And he'd pick it up and says, It's alive! It's the living word of God! It's sharper than any two-edged sword! And then he would start sharing his testimony. Yes. So the one word ministry got rather loud. <laughs> but he had something to share. Amen. And it was as fresh as that moment when he bowed one on one with God <coughs> under that fig tree. Do you remember where you were when you said it's over? Now, he didn't have to be an alcoholic. He didn't have to be a criminal. You knew who you were. Yeah. And you became contrite. You understand? Yes. You became broken before the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Arthur Stace died of a stroke July 30, 1967, in a nursing home at the age of 83, left his body to the University of Sydney, proceeds to go to charity. And two years after his death, the Sydney poet, Douglas Stewart, published these following lines. That shy, mysterious poet, Arthur Stace, whose work was just one single minded <coughs> word, walked in the utmost depths of time and space, and there his word was spoken, and he heard. Eternity, eternity, it banged him like a bell, dulcet from heaven, sounding somber from hell. And so how does that word eternity find you? Is it intimidating? Is it intriguing? Is it inviting? And so this truth, the truth is that God has created every human being with a sense of that word. With a sense, listen, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, yeah. verse 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Yeah. Notice, he has also sent the word. Now that's an English translation of Hebrew. The world into their heart. In Hebrew, that's, that's uh, Elohim. That's Olam. That's Elohim, Olam, the God of eternity. What is that word, Olam? What does it say? What does it mean? It means to be a duration, a long duration, forever, continuous existence, or eternity. The truth here is this. All humanity, lost or saved, has a sense of it, has a sense of an eternity, an existence that is beyond this present world. And that's why it's a powerful word. I think God did that. I think God moved that evangelist to make that connection on that revival night with that one man to burn into him and teach him to write one word. Because if there's one word that will stir a whole city up, it's eternity. It registers here. We're all born creatures of eternity in that one day we will each leave the confounds of time and space to enter the eternal state. God has breathed his eternal breath into every living soul, every man, woman, God's eternal breath is that part of you which will continue to exist past the shadow of time in this life. You see, eternal life is not just duration of life. Eternal life is to share the life of God. Now, that happened when, when uh, Arthur was saved. But everyone saved or lost has the eternal spirit of God that will go out and live somewhere. And so like a beacon, the word eternity flashed from Sydney Harbor Bridge, sending a message from heaven itself, warning us that time is swiftly passing, that we're creatures of eternity. The word eternity speaks of uh, a, uh, ancient past and a continuing future, a continuous existence. And it means forever. It describes literally describes God Himself. He is eternity, isn't He? God's existence. Read uh, Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. What are we learning here? God is eternity. Okay? Yes. It is His dwelling place. God is eternity. To go out into eternity is to go out and meet God. He is, he is I am. He is the self-existent one. And by the way, uh, the New Testament echoes this truth. It says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, it's a point there the man wants to die, and after that, that's it. Then no more, right? After that, it's over. You're done into non-existence. No. After that, what? The judgment. Oh, God. 
Isaiah 15, 57, 15 b tells us that God's name is holy, that he dwells in the high and holy place. And so the prophet Isaiah has given us a vision, and he received a vision of God. Remember when the heavens were open and, and Isaiah looked into heaven, the prophet? It's recorded in Isaiah chapter 6. He was able to look in, really into the throne room of heaven. And you know what he saw? He saw God upon the throne. He was high and what? Lifted up. He was surrounded by seraphim. I mean, he was surrounded by angels. He got a view into glory. It's kind of like uh, Revelation chapter 4. Where John was caught up into the throne room of heaven. Isaiah saw that by God's power. And you know what those angels were saying? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And so this picture of eternity is great. But it, gives, it presents a problem for us. See, God is holy and we are not. And we're not prepared for eternity. We're unholy and sinful creatures. And upon seeing the eternal, the thrice holy God, the prophet Isaiah responds. You know, I tell you what, when you really see God, uh, it casts the light on you. And then how did he respond to this vision of a thrice holy God in heaven? Verse 5 of Isaiah 6. Woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I tell you what, that burned into the prophet Isaiah's mind and heart. He never forgot. God of eternity, in eternity, His throne, holy and really. That's the setting of our text in Isaiah <coughs> chapter 57. In verses 1 through 13 of Isaiah 57. The prophet presents a very sinful and corrupt society. I mean, we could go back to the Balmain slums. And we could find Arthur there. Arthur stayed in that wretched, wretched environment in which he was raised. And that's what, that's what Isaiah has seen in his whole nation. In Isaiah chapter 57 verses 1 and 2, he describes a nation where the God-fearing Righteous population was dwindling. I mean, the people who were God believers, who were really Christians, you know, not just name, but really Christians, that was shrinking in the nation. Sound like America? Verses 3 and 4. The Isaiah saw society, what? Characterized by morality. Every man does that which is right. In his own eyes. I don't care what God says or what his book says. <laughs> Who is he to call and tell me? And, and he identifies immorality, cruelty, barbarianism. In Isaiah 6 through 13, chapter 57, uh, Isaiah describes a nation filled with all sorts of idols. You know, there's a God void in every one. And we try to fill it with a lot of things, don't we? To fill that, that God shaped void in us. We try materialism. You know, money, sex, I mean, entertainment, whatever. We just, we try to fill it with that to, to, to satisfy it. I tell you what, there's a God-shaped eternity void in every human soul that can only be filled by God Himself. Amen. And today our nation Amen. is like Isaiah's nation. It's not ready. It's not ready to enter eternity. It's not ready to meet a holy God. Our neighbors are not ready. Our neighbors are not. Our world stands condemned because... God knows that we're sinners, you know, and something has to change, and He can. Yes. But there's hope. Amen. Here in verse 57, verse 13b, it, it kind of pivots. He, he talks about kind of like, you know, the, the slums and, and uh, Arthur Space's terrible life, and then that, you know, that one day he, he went to church and heard a got a free meal and a message right it kind of pivots here in verse 13b look at it it says he in the midst of all of this is but he that putteth his what trust in me shall possess the land shall inherit my holy mountain 
said, well, what, what is this hope? I mean, how can sinful man dwell with a holy, righteous God? Verse 15, they continues. He tells us that the Holy One, God Himself, will dwell in the heart of one, notice the word, who is contrite, repentant, or humble. It reads, and I will dwell in the high and holy place with Him also. But there's a condition. That is, of a contrite, humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble. To revive the heart of the contrite ones. And so the good news is there's a way we can prepare to enter eternity to meet a thrice holy God. And as we consider the life and ministry of Arthur Stace, as well as Isaiah, verse 15 through 21, we're challenged with four great realities concerning your eternity. Let's look at them. First, you're destined to enter eternity. I mean, we each must face the reality that we are all bound for eternity. We all have an appointment with the God who dwells in eternity. Ecclesiastes 12. We go go back to that uh, great book, chapter 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, because we're made of dust, right? And the Spirit shall what? Return to God. Amen. Who gave it? There's a great preacher once said in, in a message, you can laugh and mock at eternity, but you can't laugh away its reality. You turn your face from it, it'll leap upon your back. Say it's an unpleasant subject to think about, but it will be more unpleasant to endure. We all must meet eternity. There's a famous English author who's known for his... Uh, uh, novels about the sea, Joseph Conrad, and he talks about the sea through all of his books, and he always says this thing about the sea. He says, it will all, it always gets you at last. The sea always wins. They always get you at last. And so those words are true of eternity. It will get everyone at last. But the question is, are you ready? Second, to enter eternity prepared, and I think it's really clear, you got to be broken. We must face the reality that we need to be broken for eternity. Yeah, isn't that just the opposite of, of false religion? You know, you've got to be, you've got to be perfect. You know, you got to get your life just so so, or you'll not go to heaven. Well, this is just the opposite. Isaiah 57, 15 tells us that, that, that God will only dwell in the hearts of those who are broken, who are contrite. That word contrite means to change your mind. To say, I was wrong. I mean, repentant, humble. I mean, this is the testimony of Arthur's days. He was a broken man, broken by a life of sin, or heard the message of the gospel, and you know what? He was broken. He faced his need of a Savior. He became yeah. broken before the Savior, repenting of his sins, trusting in Jesus Christ, and, and a great change came into his life. Amen. But it only came when he reached the end of himself. Uh -huh. I mean, when, he, when his, he had no resources to offer, it was the Lord who changed this man once he was broken. You see, Jesus Christ is the only one who can make the difference in your eternity. And in this lifetime, you must come to grips with your sinful condition and need of a Savior. And those who are not broken before the Savior in this life, well, they'll be broken eventually. It's sad to say, one day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. But that's not in repentance. That's in fear and dread and conviction. Jesus said this in Matthew 21, 42. Did you ever read the scriptures? Look at this. The stone, which the builders rejected. We sang about the cornerstone. The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Look in verse 41. Later he says, he adds to this, whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be what? Broken. But whosoever it shall fall, oh, it'll ground him to powder. I mean, divine denying Jesus is like 
beating your head against a brick wall. It's like standing in the way of a falling boulder. And guess who's going to lose? The rejection of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And, and this is what he's saying. It's both foolish and fatal. Oh, Jerusalem, how off I would have received you, but you were so prideful and you were so stubborn that you wouldn't be broken. And it went. In Luke 18, Jesus told the story of two men, a proud, self-righteous Pharisee yes. and a lowly publican, went to the temple to pray, and the Pharisee stood with his head high and prayed, Oh God, I thank thee that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as publican. I fast twice a week, I give tithes, all that I do. Oh, look at my righteousness, look what I do. And oh, then the lowly publican wouldn't even lift his head, and he beat his chest and he says, God, be merciful to me. What? A sinner. A sinner. And Jesus goes on to say this. I tell you, this man, the broken one, the contrite one, he, he, that one, he went back home. He left the temple. He left and he returned justified. Amen. What does that word justified mean? I mean, in the sight of God. Declared right in the sight of God. And that's what God is looking for, you see? He's looking for the broken, the contrite heart. For he said, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be what? Abased. And he that humbles himself shall be exalted. And so, here's the key to eternity. We, we have this lifetime to become broken before God, bow before the Savior. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Here's the third truth. Only if you are broken for eternity will you be healed and blessed. And those who are broken will be blessed. Oh, by the way, now and in eternity. Amen? Yeah. And, and back in Isaiah 57, 18 and 19, let's pick it up. It says, I have seen his ways. That's interesting. Just stop a minute. Because when you, now listen to me. You know, we're not saved by good works, but Paul in Ephesians says that we're saved what? We've been ordained. So if you've really been broken, if you've really been saved before God, then you'll see His ways. It, it'll show up Amen. in your attitude. It'll show up in your conduct, your commitments. He says... And I will heal him. I will lead him also. I will restore comforts to him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of his lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off. And to him that is near, saith the Lord. I, and I will heal him. And that's, you know, that is the testimony of our first steps. The power of God in his life. To change him. I mean, his ruined, twisted life. Just turned around. Turned around. Later, a resident of Sydney said this. It says a lot about Sydney. The author states he grew up in a brothel, came back from war, shell shot, became a habitual criminal and alcoholic, should be able to reinvent himself. I tell you what, Arthur Stace would, would cough right there and say, or protest. Mm -hmm. If anyone knew, Arthur Stace knew that he couldn't do it. No doubt he had tried. In 1930, he begged the sergeant of the Regent Street Station to lock him up so he'd stop drinking. No, Arthur didn't reinvent himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he just simply <coughs> surrendered. And he became a new creation in Christ Jesus, you see. And it was the Lord who healed him, amen? It was the Lord who changed him. Not himself. And once we are broken, we allow the Lord to come into our lives and heal us from the inside out. I love it yesterday. And if you've been sure they usually have the unity candle, they have the unity sand. Well, they had a cross. And they talked about how their lives are together in the cross. And it really mirrored yes. uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 5 or 3. The husband's what? Agape your Wives is Christ agape the church and gave himself for it. Yes. And it talked about the only love that is worthy of marriage. And that's the word, that's the love that is experienced and demonstrated at the cross. And you know that is the hope of their union. 
God heals them mm -hmm. and fills them. Amen? Amen. How? Well, the Lord heals you by giving you a purpose for, your, for living your life. Yes. The Lord heals you by giving you a new perspective on life. Amen. The Lord heals you by giving you His power in your life to change. Power to overcome sin. Amen. The Lord heals you by imparting a peace that, that Brother Dwight sang about Amen. this morning. Past all understanding. The Lord heals you by giving you His eternal promises. And He fills your life with what? Hope. Amen. Yes. Here's the last thing. If you refuse to be broken, you'll be banished from eternity. Verse 20 and 21. But. You know, you know there's pivot points. He talks about a fallen world. And he talks about a holy God. Then he talks about a contrite heart. Right? And a healed heart. And then he turns again. But he, but the what? Wicked. Or like a troubled sea. I ain't going from fire to fire. Let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try this. Kind of like Arthur. A troubled See, he cannot rest, he says. Now look at this. Whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Yes. What a picture. This is what he says in verse 21. There is what? No, no peace, says the Lord to the wicked, in rebuke of the ungodlessness of his day. Balis Pascal says, we make a nothing of eternity, we make eternity of nothing. Arthur Stace wasn't born in a peaceful home. He wasn't born in a peaceful environment. He slept on the house yes. when his dad was drunk. I tell you what, he died in peace. He died in peace. And it's an amazing thing, isn't it? When you have peace with God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. When you know that you're justified, right with God, not anything that you've done, but all that God has provided in the person of Jesus Christ. Come on. Amen. Yeah. Yes. He entered a Arthur Stace entered a nursing home in 83, and then he, he says that he told the resident nurse, I'm not going to leave here under my own steam. He, he knew that his time had come, that it was perfectly all right with him. Mm -hmm. I, I was in a hospital room a couple weeks ago, a week or so ago with Darla, and Brother Bill McCain was there, and he, he was cognizant, and I talked in his ear, and I hugged him, and I cried. And I prayed for him. Amen. And he, he had the biggest smile on his face. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the foot of the bed, his daughter, and she was struggling with him dying. And I looked at, I looked at Darla and I said, Darla, this is the land where everything dies. Mm -hmm. I said, but it's okay with him. Look at him. Yeah. It's okay. You're, it's a struggle with you. It's not with him. And I know why. Amen. Don't you? Yes. And suddenly she had peace. Yes. I said, you know, for a child of God, there's a whole lot worse things than die. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. it's just living. Because yeah. you know. Come on. Yeah. Amen. You know. Amen. Arthur knew. His is the testimony of the power of one surrendered life. But God says it's not so with the laws. Because they've never been broken. They have no peace. They have no final resting place. They're bound to spend eternity away from the presence of God. Engulfed with the eternal flames of hell. Just south of Melbourne. There's a magnificent seascape. There's rock formations that are called the Twelve Apostles. And then when you go on down, there's a hollow place hollowed out by the sea called Thunder Cave. And, you know, Brent and I were talking about it. You got the apostles, and then you got 
Thunder Cave, you know? And then, you know, if you, if you pass, if you bypass the message and ministry of the apostles of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you hear the thunder of judgment. Yeah. And that's what he's saying here. I mean, the key is you. The key is your own heart bowing before him. And if you stand erect and refuse to bow, then eternity will still happen. Amen. Today, Arthur would say eternity. I wish I could shout that word everywhere in the streets of Sydney, of Dallas, of Garland, Mesquite, Plano, Richardson, Rowland, Saxon, Wiley. I think it's still the need. I, I, really, I do. I see a parallel between the prophet Isaiah in Israel, Arthur Stace yes. in World War I and early 20th century in Sydney, Australia, and us here today in 2018 in Metroplex. Mm -hmm. We're in the same situation. And you know what? The remedy is the same. Yes. There's no peace, he says, to the unbroken. I read my Bible every year. And I, I, I'd be uh, deceiving you to say I understood all of it. I never will. It keeps me leaning forward. I've never really understood chapter 66. If you're a Bible reader, you've been there. And I don't understand it. But it's in the eternal state. And it says those are there who take a trip. But to a place that seems like Gehenna. It's serious stuff. I don't understand it. But a Christ, rejecting Christ, has become trivial in this culture. The word gospel has become trivial. And I tell you what, it's not to God. And it's the only, it's the only answer and the only antidote for the eternal state. Do you really believe that? I put my life on it. And Christ died and rose again. Amen? Amen. So that we be justified. And that we could have peace. So where were you? You will spend it somewhere. Where? I said, well, what's the purpose of this message to you? If you do not know Christ, why not? Second, that's why we're here. Amen. God can use our first days. He can use us. And that's why we're here. Amen. To connect a willing Savior and a needy sinner. Because we've been there. Amen. Father in the heavens, we close the service. We're about to embark on a week of evangelism in our teens. But Father, we're to think about death. That memorial service tomorrow, man, that was broken and contrite. And had a wonderful, peaceful spirit. And I know the reason is that Christ came into his life. And so, Father, we're talking to a generation that is self-righteous, that believes there's no eternity, you die, that's just it, that everything's explained by material, uh, material things and matter, and that there's no afterlife state. There's no absolute truth and who are you to say and I don't care what God says and that's but this is really nothing new that was the temptation in the garden hath God said same lie same deception I pray this morning that you'll lift the veil from the eyes and the heart and that um You'll do in a heart today what you did in Arthur's heart. And in the heart of those believers that are here this morning. And in order, those of us like Arthur need to be revived. We do. We get cold. We get self-focused. think it's all about us. 
we get so locked into doing the church thing and we just need revival. So pray, I, Lord, I pray that you revive our hearts for a world that is dying and facing eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand in